Hello there, welcome back to the Agassino Zynga show with I, your host, Agassino Zynga, and this is episode number what, two, no, 699, not 299, actually 699, so wherever you're finding this, wherever you're hearing this, it is 699, and I hope you are doing well wherever you may be. How am I? You know how it is, all good in the hood, cannot complain, all good in the hood. I'm currently recording this from a very un, um, unfamiliar environment, let's just say, um, for the last couple of days, you know, had some kind of, you know, some household duties I had to sort out, some obligations that had to be met. So I'm now recording this from a very, um, unfamiliar location. If you're watching this via video, you would have seen by the, via the background that it's not the same as where I usually am. And that's because I'm in this very secret, undisclosed location that you shall never know about and you shall never see. But that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. We're going to be, you know, piling on the show and just getting what needs to be done in terms of talking about all that good content stuff that we all know and love. That's the most important thing in it. That's the most important thing in it. Well, what else I've been up to? This week has been a bit of a crazy one, to be honest. Loads of like life admin stuff had to be done. Loads of, um, you know, Lots of getting back to basics after a couple of weeks of a pretty crazy, a pretty out there, pretty loose, pretty debauch ridden couple of weeks, which usually happens with me when I'm not really in a good sort of schedule. When I feel like everything's kind of gone awry, I usually just, you know, think, you know what, fuck it, let's just go all the way awry. And I don't really kind of like calibrate it backwards and usually it ends up biting me in the ass. So I'm happy now I've kind of got things back where they need to be so I can start to kind of being, you know, getting back to where I want to be in terms of trying to be the best version of myself and trying to, not trying to, achieving and getting to a level where I am the best version of myself of of course but you have to first shed and quit some things that i probably shouldn't be doing as often as i am if you know you know and then i'll be able to kind of take those steps but for now it's a bit mad i'm not gonna lie but i'm happy that i've been able to have these last couple of weeks because i think getting out of your system is really important and then stepping one foot in front of the other into the direction where you need to be going is the best way to go about things. I know I sound vague. I know I sound like Tony Robbins. I know I sound like some crappy, some other non crap, some other crappy nondescript motivational speaker now, but I promise you, I promise you I'm getting there and I'm slowly but surely getting there. But you know, we have to kind of take these things little by little, slowly by slowly. Um, I've been watching Foundation. That's been pretty decent. Good to get my mind off things. I think that's why I probably love sci-fi. I don't really long for this kind of crazy futuristic utopia because whatever will be will be in the future. But it's just more so of a real good way to kind of unplug from the worries and the stresses of your regular everyday life and just sort of, you know, it, it completely immerse yourself in this world and think about how you would act in the same world, how you would respond to certain situations. Obviously, some of the technology and the architecture Texas is amazing but just in general just the challenges that they all kind of have to behind a battle um philosophically um you know relationship wise family wise um there are all things that we kind of know and you know are kind of familiar with in our everyday life but they're a little bit different through the prism of the story they're telling you know foundations based on the legendary series of books by the legendary sci-fi writer isaac isamov which i have to end up reading at one point I did download an audio book version of it a couple months ago, but I never got around to kind of listening to it because unfortunately the audio Apple kind of audio book app isn't as easy to use as it once was like in the past what i used to do which is really bad i'd go online there's this particular pirate forum that you couldn't find where everybody kind of uploads audio books and just book scans pdfs and stuff for, to put on your readers and whatnot and um before audiobooks or the books app on on apple especially on the mac or sorry ios was easy to use you could essentially just drag and drop it into your um I, f I think at the time it must have been the music app the itunes app before it was called music the itunes app and you could basically drag and drop it sync it up with your phone and then you had all of these flipping audiobooks ready to use and the reason why i say that is because on the on the kind of official books app 
on your phone or the audiobooks one, it had the ability of like remembering where you last left the book. So if you were listening to it on the way to work and you stopped that particular chapter, when you picked it up the next day, even after listening to music and doing all the random stuff you do on your phone, it would still have kept where you are. But what now, because the app doesn't work as easy as before, you have to just drag it on your phone like a file, which is just an MP3. So every time I stop listening to the book, I have to kind of even write down the time that I left it at or take a screenshot of the screen that shows where I kind of left it, which is, you know, sometimes you can forget doing those things. So it's become really hard to, um, you know, listen to audio books on my phone because I'm not going to spend 50 pounds or whatever, maybe $30 a month to download free audio books per year or per month. So that's not happening as well, because I think that's also crazily overpriced, but you know, I'll figure out along the way. But regardless, the TV series itself is amazing. I've really enjoyed every part of it. I think for the most part, from what I've been able to see, judging based on the YouTube videos I've been watching online from people that have read the books, it is quite faithful to the book series, which is flipping great to see. And they've done a good job in terms of translating some of the more complex themes of the book into the TV series. And people so far are absolutely loving it. So I'm a big fan of it. I've been watching a lot of it. And season two has been absolutely splendid. I think I've left it at se season two, episode five was the latest one. And that was a really good episode, even though a lot of it kind of contained, you know, mostly, you know, f relationship type of dreaming, whatever type of stuff it was, which is sometimes can be a bit filler. I thought it did kind of progress the story along really well. And I like something they do. I think a lot of good TV shows that kind of trust the writing and trust the quality of the actors and the character development they don't like try to exhaustively explain anything to you. So they might have a storyline that contains two people from the past. No, they might have a storyline from episode one that they want to necessarily try and wrap up in a nice bow in episode three and four. You know what I mean? They'll just leave it and come back to an episode eight randomly. So I like that because I think sometimes when shows don't have good stories, don't have good writing, they sometimes try to overly explain or really kind of conclude, you know, stories and interactions with people because there's nothing else to tell. So I think um, Foundation obviously isn't that and they do a good job of doing that. So I'm really happy with the show so far and it's definitely one of my standouts. So if you're looking for something to watch, I recommend you check out Foundation. What else have I been up to? Oh, nothing else actually. Let's move on. Move on to the actual pod itself. So these last few weeks or these last few not weeks let me not be honest these last few months i think some of you have probably noticed as well with my lack of you know club night reviews and stuff and my lack of burkine updates um going there physically myself instead of just news online i've been feeling a little bit miffed by the whole clubbing scene i think maybe it's because i'm not really enjoying my djing at the moment i've kind of taken my foot off the pedal in terms of recording mixes and listening to stuff and generally just being immersed in that world maybe that's taint that's kind of like somehow influencing my behavior when it comes to just being a raver and a quote-unquote punter on the dance floor but i think in general i've kind of had this feeling ever since we kind of came out of lockdown i've kind of felt like i've been missing you know i've been, I've, I've been kind of offbeat by just half a second it kind of feels like by a millisecond or something i'm just not there where i need to be and i'm not too sure if it's because of the age thing if it's just because of the time thing or if it has to do with you know, spending the last two and a half years as, we, as most of us did, right, under some type of lockdown where you weren't able to go to regular clubs, it kind of made me, you know, it kind of, I'm not kind of in practice, right? I haven't got a lot of practice in my bones and my body and shit. So when we finally were allowed to go back outdoors, I kind of felt a little bit behind the mark. That might be the reason. I'm not really too sure. Either way, something that has been bothering me for a bit and I haven't really figured out a good way to kind of handle it and sort it. And I guess... The only other thing I've been trying to do is trying to make like, you know, house partying fun, trying to make the whole idea of like, you know, streaming sets at home fun, getting on it at home somewhat fun, but it doesn't really replicate the feeling or the vibe of going to a club and kind of sharing that experience rand with like random strangers in there. It's never, ever going to explain it. So I need to find a way to kind of reactivate that because I feel like I'm not kind of out of it because I clearly still enjoy going to places like Berkine. And I think maybe in the long term, I'm probably going to choose an option of going to like 
abroad to rave you know twice a year and maybe a, a festival so maybe it might involve like three or four like really big not or big what well, three or four nights out and then the rest of it just i'll kind of play it by ear but the idea of me kind of raving on the london scene week in week out has kind of got a bit boring and i'm kind of over it i've kind of seen most of the things i need to see and the times when i do go out I think with very few exceptions, there's a few parties out there that do some great stuff. Um, Tech culture that happened just the other day in Fold is absolutely amazing. Um, and a few other people as well, I'm, I'm forgetting to name right now. But in general, there's not really a lot of kind of great party promotions out there or raves or clubs really that are really pushing things and really kind of taking things to the next level. It's all kind of the same old, same old, isn't it? Even my beloved Fold, unfortunately, is kind of, you know, succumbing to the same issues. And I'm not too sure if it's because, you know, I'm kind of over Fold or maybe Fold's getting a little bit too bait or maybe they just, you know, they're a business and they have to try other things because that place is open, not just to serve the whims of myself or other kind of trendy cool kids but it's there to essentially you know um provide a space for all people who make music or who kind of you know build themselves under the banner of quote-unquote electronic music and i'm sure they also have an aspect of their place where it's just a commercial place where people go and do photo shoots and shit and adverts and whatever it may be and bits of filming so they have loads of obligations they have to kind of meet so that might kind of influence the quality or lack thereof of the parties i've kind of gone there and been a bit you know underwhelmed i had to spend like 30 quid and i've left at like 3 a.m because i wasn't enjoying myself now that could it would be me it could be the place who knows but they had a really interesting discussion about it on the techno subreddit that i'm actually going to play for you now or not play well i'm actually going to show you now actually if i can get up on my screen and bear with me a second here not that one it's this one there we go yeah they had a really interesting um, conversation about it on the techno subreddit where they basically were speaking about the same things and their conclusion mostly was that it was it was drugs that have changed the kind of climate or changed nightlife forever and kind of not made it as enjoyable as it once was which i'm not really too sure that's the case i think drugs have always been a good and bad part of the dance music slash electronic music scene i think it just is what it is um i think nightlife in general kind of has a very fraught relationship with drugs and how it helps and sometimes hinders the scene and i don't think it's any different nowadays but some people will swear to you that you know the introduction of ghb or the popularity of it in the last few years the popularity of even ketamine in the last few years has really taken things to the next level i've seen you know i've watched a vice documentary recently in ibiza of these two guys who were i guess bartenders there and they kind of double up in, in at night as also dealers but they obviously do all their own gear because it's just you know it's probably hard to balance being a business person and also being a a, a a bartender in that scene over there but i remember during the whole entire video where they were filming it like they were taking you know pro proper big healthy bumps of cake no ketamine sorry cake ketamine the whole time they were doing the the interview and it's clear to see that judging by that clip judging by what i've seen when i go outside judging by what i read online that clearly you know ghb and care have kind of taken over the scene in a big big way so i know i've heard some people say maybe the, the whole cocaine thing is an issue because people say cocaine becomes like a drug where it sort of makes you lose your i won't say inhibitions but you lose a little bit of your manners you become a little bit more kind of direct and shit you become a bit of an an oaf an ogre so maybe that kind of lends to it but the stuff that i've seen out when i've been out has been more people looking and acting like zombies as opposed to the usual you know standard this is my space what the fuck are you doing here shoulder barges that you get in certain you know queer lgbtq plus spaces which makes sense anyway because you know us straights are sort of like invading all of their hallowed spaces so it makes sense that they walk around with a little bit of a chip on their shoulder a little bit of attitude because we're kind of taking up room but i don't think it's a drug i think it's all the things included but this thread kind of speaks about it and I want to kind of go over some of the answers or you know, open it up with the original post and then go down with some of the answers of other um, Redditors and what they've said and kind of add my two pence. So the thread title is, have the drugs changed or was it going on in clubs or what is going on in clubs? Question mark. 
the person asked the following question. Lately, you can notice a shift in behavior in techno clubs and festivals. I speak of Germany here. One that is rather ego, ego, egoistic, or ego, I guess e e egotistic. Um, I'd argue driven by a mix of so-called designer drugs. I don't speak of usual bump of speed, commander MDMA. This is different. It certainly hasn't miraculously started since COVID, but the vibe has noticeably changed in a peculiar or even dark way. Have you noticed something similar? How do you see it? I'm interested. I find that he said designer drugs because this person said designer drugs because I do remember hearing a few people say to me when I was out actually that that's another thing that's been bubbling on the underground. Not even the regular class A's that we're used to, but the research chemicals. There's quite a few of them that popped up that basically. I guess the idea behind them is that they combine the best of like an MDMA and like a speedy or cocaine type of vibe in order to kind of give you the best type of experience. And I guess the best example of it will be that 2C drug that everyone takes in um, Colombia and other parts of, I guess, Central or South America. That's, that's, you know, it's got a bit of a pink coloring on it and shit. And people take that because it gives them a high and also makes them feel kind of euphoric and shit. So I think that's also been an issue. So can you can imagine if people are getting dodgy, normal quote-unquote class a is full of fentanyl can you imagine just how sketchy and dodgy and really unreliable the whole rc scene is imagine how unreliable the whole research chemical scene is crazy anyway the first um reply here from somebody says as follows okay older raver here in the 40s mostly clubbing in london been going out since the 90s i would say on this subject is this it's always been this way which i agree but there's more choice and less reason to bump into darker crowds back in the day if you didn't want to. There are good parties and good crowds and good clubs, but bad parties with good crowds and good parties and bad crowds. And they can often be hit and miss. The good nights are all over, um, but you may have to hunt to find them if things feel like they have been not uh, gone less, less enjoyable. And I have to agree with this because I think from what I've seen anyway, again, I'm not super plugged in as I once was. I'm not promoting parties as often as I did. I'm not DJing as often as I did. I'm not even going out as much as I did. But I do follow a few people here and there, especially on my main Instagram page, who are way cooler than I am and a lot more plugged in. And from what I can see, sometimes when I'm on their Instagram stories and shit, I see that they're usually at spaces that don't look like conventional club spaces. They're either somebody's warehouse space, they're either a converted space, it's even a legal rave or something that's kind of like hush hush friends and family. I've even heard through the great fan of certain people, especially in the gay scene, they have a they have a rule with some of their good parties where they're not even allowed to post them up on the main event listing pages. They're not allowed to post about it on their social medias. It's like a thing that they do. They kind of send a memo to each other. Hey, we've got this rave going on. We've got this great DJs playing. We want to keep the vibe like, you know, nice and gay and not have the straights there. Don't post it anywhere. So clearly there is from those actions. I feel like they, all of those people who are usually on the cutting edge, even they're recognizing the regular club scenes a bit shit. So they purposely creating their own little things, but also making it sure that they're only keeping it to themselves. So I feel like that's proof that there are other things out there, but I feel like some of the things out there, they don't really want you to be there. You know, they don't want you to go there. They kind of want it to be shh. So it continues. In the early days, everywhere seemed epic, carried on the wave of euphoria, raves with little helpers and being part of a young crowd. As time goes on, um, the, the euphoria experience is not as focused and you start to see the real environment. This is the classic things are not as good as they used to be. True. And I've kind of fell on the same sort of trap before. I think I felt that when I went to flip in Bergheim a few years ago. I, no, sorry, a few months ago. No, maybe it was, no, yeah, it was last year actually, last year in June when I went Bergheim and I made this massive rant that everybody was kind of high-fiving me about in my Instagram stories. But after the fact, I kind of felt really embarrassed and a little bit corny and cringy because it kind of just felt, you know, it was kind of, in one part, it was like an old man screaming at the fucking clouds. In another way, it was also a little bit of a humble brag. Oh, I've been there and now I'm over it. It kind of felt, I kind of felt a little bit gross. I was kind of embarrassing myself. That's why I ended up taking it down very quickly. But I even I've even I've succumbed to that. And I'm usually, I feel like I got more to try to be as self-aware as I can about my position and where I am and shit in my life with these sort of things. But even I can fall in that trap. So it continues. However, this is only half the story. A lot of people go out to listen to music. They want to meet new people, dance all night and have a smile on their face. There's always been the other crowd, though, the ones who just want a night out, don't mind a fight, drink or don't get happy or don't get the same happy vibe from pills. But then we are. But then there are ravers. Sorry. 
but then my eyes here are going crazy but then there are hundreds of venues that they would often go to the biggest venues that had the biggest advertising budget the happier the happier ravers were going to the other nights which were held in less known spaces however as clubs have reduced over the last 15 odd years neither side has the same number of options lumping us all together in the same venues far more often and this is definitely a good point because this is my prime point when it comes to the whole thing that we have in the uk where we have these really draconian insane insane drinking fucking laws where essentially forget london let's say a smaller town outside of london usually their part their pubs will close at 11 and if they have a club or if they have a cocktail bar they'll usually stop serving at 12 so usually in those smaller towns what you end up seeing is like because the pubs don't have a long window to stay open they'll usually have drink promotions, especially on the weekends to get people to come in there early and to hang around because they know if they can get somebody in the pub early, most likely they're not going to just come in for one round. They're going to stay for two, three or four. So they'll give them insane drink deals. That mean they'll get super drunk. They won't be eating that whole time because most pubs don't, you know, they don't have food. The ones that do have food, they're not probably worth that going to for a night out. And then most likely after at 11, when they all get chucked out of the pub, they're all steaming from drinking from like i don't know four to eleven with no food maybe a couple pack of crisp or whatever and then they all you know spill over into the nearest club that's in their vicinity and then all that club ends up getting a whole load of punters who have been drinking since four plus whoever comes to their cocktail bar or club specifically for their thing and you just get two of the you know weirdest crowds together in that space and then at two a.m. when that club space closes you get all those people spilling out to the street at the same time which is no surprise why those places usually or those smaller towns have usually people fighting in the streets and going crazy i saw it happen when i went to visit an old friend in flipping hastings a long time ago it was the same sort of vibe like as soon as we all left this kind of like you know quasi cocktail bar place whatever um that was also a club we then suddenly ended up with people that we saw earlier in the pub people that we saw earlier outside drinking the street all together on the street at the same time whereas if you had you know more looser relaxed you know drinking laws or permissions similar to what they have in berlin where essentially everything's open until 6 a.m you end up having people coming a little bit earlier also leaving any time between like 9 to 6 a.m because there's such a long window to drink whereas in the uk we don't so people rush they to take all their babies down they end up getting too drunk and end up leaving those clubs incredibly intoxicated and sometimes that ends up spilling over at home you know with you know what and it gets worse and worse and worse it continues the hard the, the reply it says the good nights and the good crowds will exist but you need to hunt them if it takes you a while to find something great then it'll take only the de dedicated ravers of the scene effort to find them as well choose what less known venues with specific lineups look at places where the crowd has less of an older raver you'll find the magic in those venues often smaller capacities are better when a club holds 200 people and you all know each other by the end of the night they are out there but it might take time to find them when you do enjoy this do to exist and that's the truth really i think if anything all of these challenges probably should embolden you to try and venture out and find new things or do what i did when i was coming up in the scene I felt like I wasn't getting my shot. I still don't think I'm getting my shot now. And what I did, instead of complaining and crying about it, I just went and started my own club night, right? Like with a friend and just put that on, booked myself to play, um, booked people that I loved to see playing. And eventually it turned into a selfish, let me just give myself an excuse to play every month. And it also just turned into a selfless, let me put on the finest party I can put on. Because my whole thing was that I've always hated people who, you know, um, would send their friends dms or messages and say hey come to my night come to my this come to my that i always went to put on an amazing party that my friends would want to come to voluntarily they didn't have to come because they were my friend i was never going to be the one to tell you to like my things share this no i don't care like that um it's not that deep i'll put out my work if my work's good enough you'll come if you don't you don't but it was about servicing and it's about creating you know amazing memories which i think we probably hopefully did and i think the same thing happened nowadays so if you're out there and you think the raves are dead and they're shit and you feel like your friends are you know are better and you do cooler things then go and set up your own thing it really isn't that hard to do pull your resources together you know hire a venue usually venues are not that expensive really especially if you're splitting the cost between a group of friends especially if they already have equipment 
and then bang you throw on your party and these days even if you don't want to you don't want to flip in hire a place of legitimately you can do stuff illegally nowadays and the cost is fairly low also you know you just got to do your googles and kind of find out where you want to go and go from there but i guess the crux of the issue is mostly if you hear someone like myself who's got a quote-unquote platform talking about it then usually the party's already dead right because i'm obviously not the person that's super plugged into all things so if it's underground and you haven't heard it from me over something you haven't seen a lot of people talk about it usually means it's a good thing so continue doing that i would say let's read a couple more of these replies because i thought some of them were really really informative another person said here which i agree this is completely opposite um reply they said i think what you're getting to is the classic parties were better before what happened to techno question mark i don't know how old you are or how long you've been going to techno parties for but i read an article a while ago on rave parties where the author had interviewed a lot of people of all ages and basically everybody was saying that parties used to be better before but what does before mean since everybody began partying at a different period before means for everyone the moment they began partying you're young the scene is new the drugs are new the scene music is new everything is amazing and five years later you're older and the most people in the club and festivals it's not as new it takes longer to recover from parties that's definitely one of my big issues and i also don't think anything has changed that much it's just that you did sure there are people coming in because of tiktok whatever that means but they're not responsible for completely changing the vibe of the clubs in germany no for sure i think if anything I think the German question is a bit different because I think it's a bit unique because I feel like in Berlin specifically, not in Germany overall, but in Berlin specifically, I think they've had it too good for too long. They've had a little bit of a quasi rave utopia over there where things are just too sweet for way too long. And they've never really been subjected to the, to the pains and the fucking horror of commercialism. And I feel like they're finally getting it now with this whole new TikTok raver generation of people, especially that girl that I featured last time on the podcast who is a door picker at a very popular club over there in Berlin. And I think from what I read online, that's kind of a thing they do a lot. Um, people that are well known um, have got a bit of a following online. They sometimes get invited to do the door at these places because it's another extra bit of cachet the club can add to its kind of a law and the lineup and whatnot. So I think they are, for the first time, you know, nowadays kind of experiencing that kind of corny, cringy side of things where I feel like in the UK specifically, we've had every iteration of it where it comes to drum and bass when that got really cheesy, corporate and commercial and really kind of lame and also kind of tech house, deep house when that became kind of, you know, corny, commercial and lame also. We've kind of had to battle those two things happening at the same time, right? Because those people that were quote unquote trendy and cool who are listening to tech house and deep house at one time and then suddenly the party's full of shufflers and no one wants to listen to it anymore and the same thing's happening with the techno scene also there's a kind of alternate techno scene there's a commercial techno scene there's an underground one there's all these different sort of places but i feel like they were over there in berlin anyway they specifically were a bit fortunate they didn't ever have to kind of go through that and they're kind of going through it now and if anything really from what i've been able to see Yes, the TikTok generation or TikTok ravers are different, but effectively it's just a different age bracket, really and truly. Um, or maybe a different kind of background of person who probably wouldn't have seen something on Instagram because they use TikTok mainly, but it's mainly what I've seen, just an age thing. A lot of younger, younger people are on TikTok and they con you know, they they consume the content on there and whatever or they you know connect to certain things differently than older folks that or you know on over other social media platforms like facebook instagram do it's just the nature of the beast um let's continue here and let's do this uh, one more and i'll move what's another top one uh this one's um okay this person said it sounds like it might be coke when i'm from um, you, we see this progression where a club starts say, really good with an underground vibe full of people who know how to party, then becomes a mainstream and the coke balls appear. That's when there's time to move on to a new venue. I think this is more relating to straights, really, coke balls. I feel like a lot of people say this, but I don't know. From what I've been seeing when I went out, especially that time I went to Berghain and, you know, I was helping that girl that looked like she was, you know, out of it. She basically, after, you know, we kind of got to go got back to her friends, I realized, or I realized with the person i was with that most likely she was on ghb that's what kind of made her this sort of zombie character and i've seen people complain about this for a while um that one guy i forgot his name um the one guy who nearly got flipping um 
who nearly got RSO closed down for good when he complained about getting chucked out of some party. He said he was a, a big, you know, GHB addict. There's a few people that I know of in my extended friend group that live over Berlin who've had issues with GHB. So clearly that drug has definitely did a number on the gay scene overall people over there. It's definitely affected them in a bad way. So I'm not surprised really that that is something that is kind of negatively affecting the scene. And I think that has more of a negative effect than the Coke thing. I would say anyway, I think that thing is definitely, definitely more of an issue going on there. But again, maybe it's changing, maybe it's getting different, but I think overall those sort of things and then, you know, the convergence of people essentially all coming out at the same time is a bit weird to think that doesn't get spoken about enough, right? Like, I don't know what you're 15 when the when the pandemic starts and then you, it ends and you come out of it and you're maybe what, 17, 18 going to your first clubs with no in-between experience there, going from like sitting at home watching the whore mixes and then suddenly going to a fucking warehouse rave. It's no wonder you're going to be freaking out. And then the same thing if you're like, you know, mid-20s and now you're in your late 20s and you're coming back out again and some of your friends have, you know, gotten married, had kids, had more kids and now you're suddenly still out there still fucking throwing shapes. It's no surprise people are feeling a little bit conflicted and a little bit weird. But in general for me, I think in conclusion, I'm at the point where I'm basically more so focusing on just getting back into, you know, loving what I do again and kind of just doing it for the fun of it. Like as good as it would be to start playing in more clubs again, you know, I have to be honest with myself. I've not really done the work necessary in the last f whatever, however many years I've kind of stopped playing out regularly to kind of make that happen. And I just, you know, need to get back to enjoying playing music before, like I did before. You know, I'd kind of make my own little mini radio shows. I'd do my own little mixes and stuff. And it was all it was all kind of for myself. And I don't think I ever sent many of those mixes to like places to get booked. I swear on my life. I think the only thing I can, the only place I can think of that I sent mixes to back in the day was maybe like Ridley Road Market Bar because I heard like Hi basically got her, you know, her start from there. She played there as a resident and kind of got noticed by somebody. And then she became one of the biggest teachers in the world. But for the most of it, I just kind of kept the mixes to myself, put them on SoundCloud and just kind of enjoyed, you know, another sort of like creative outlet that I could kind of, you know, push my energies into. And also, weirdly enough, selfishly, it was also a good way to sort of like display, illustrate and flex my musical acumen, my musical range, right? To show, okay, cool. I'm not just, you know, your kind of default black guy or default goon as I would say my old blog name and I had all those different interests that I was into so making you know mixing and DJing was a good way to kind of show that off because you were able to kind of you know start off your set with a jazz record end it with a classical record play some disco play some play some techno play some house all this stuff in between and you could kind of you know flex that you kind of knew all this stuff and you were clearly in the know um, even though people maybe would see you on you know on paper and think now you wouldn't get it so that was always good so maybe that's what i'll end up going back to just to kind of get that love going back again and then hopefully that would also kind of bleed into my raving experiences so they would become more enjoyable but i think overall my new practice of kind of you know approaching nights out more so as a kind of core thing to do here and there throughout the year three or four times plus a festival is definitely the way to go because i feel like those are more memorable than going out every weekend to these kind of shitty nights that aren't that great and just kind of effectively chasing the dragon and you know most of the time never catching it so i'd rather kind of just you know gear up for the big events and go from there because to this day i'm still kicking myself now still kicking myself now that i wasn't able to go to fucking um Berger and csd i'm honestly kicking myself i wish i was able to go but you know unfortunately um i just didn't plan it well enough and then by the time it came back around the flight tickets were just crazy and it didn't happen so it kind of is what it is moving on from that one we got to talk about this news here courtesy of ra regarding a new london club that's opening and i think most of us are kind of upset about this sort of stuff because it's like jesus christos man when would this end so this is courtesy of ra and it said london is getting a new fifteen thousand capacity venue in a former ikea i'm not sure about you but i feel like the last thing we need is a fifteen thousand capacity venue <laughs> in london i swear to god we need smaller spaces in more sp places like i think i said during like the peak of like you know fold when it kind of first opened that might have been like 2018 2019 i think i'm not really too sure right but i think i remember saying 
when that first play when it opened i think one of my reviews when i was flipping drunk and high and stuff and i was super ex- happy that i was able to go and blah 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 and basically crying about it i remember saying to myself oh you know what they should do actually they should have they should possibly do a thing yeah i think this is the one yeah 2018 it opened because i went to the first dance i'm checking my phone now the first fold party i went to was two august 18th 2018 I remember when I went there, I said, oh, what they should do going forward, because the whole idea behind Ford was that it's going to be the first 24-hour club in London, which obviously it's not now because, you know, London fucking permits and whatever else probably changed it. But it's still one of the only places open until 6 so a.m. in the morning. So most likely what I said would be a good thing is that if they had a version of Ford in every part of London, so like north, you know, north, south, east, west, whatever, have one or two in those locations so that what would happen is that you wouldn't have people having to trek all the way from west north or south up to fucking drop fold but instead you'd create all these little local scenes around these places that are like you know for i think fold might be 500 to 700 capacity venues so it's like small is small enough to have up and coming people play every sunday at unfold but also big enough to hold you know richie horton label night or something i think that's a perfect sort of blend and then what you do you'd keep a place like fucking you know print works which i don't give a fuck about but you keep a place like that open so that when you do as a dj sort of like graduate from like the minor leagues you have a platform to play a bigger place to play that's what should happen but we don't have enough of those but of course you know for some reason in the same way London loves a good fucking food truck market, we love a good fucking, you know, um, listening bar, we love a good, I don't know, what else do we love? We love all these fucking things, but one thing we don't love as a country or as a fucking city, we don't love to fucking give people and enc- or encourage people to open up a new and interesting club spaces. That seems to be off the table. But if you've got another burger joint to open up, if you've got another fucking pizza place to open up, if you've got another fusion Japanese place, they're going to lay the fucking red carpet for you. But there that you open a nightclub, suddenly all these fucking permits and restrictions come at you. It's annoying. Anyway, let's continue. It says, run by Broadwick Live, drum sheds were open in Tottenham in 20 in September. The, the new 50 capacity, 15,000 capacity. Like, imagine how big that is. Can you imagine what 15,000 phones look like in the air as fucking, um, what's his face? As Jamie Jones, like, you know, builds up some terrible tech house drop. Can you imagine what that looks like? Not to be confused with Broadwick Live's former venue of the same name called Drum Sheds. This new space is situated in a former Ikea in Tottenham. The 680, 608 square foot arena will host dance music events as well as fashion shows, set builds and more. Um, the program is still TBA. Drum Sheds has joined other large scale venues operated by Broadwick Live, including the Beams, Printworks, Depot in Manchester and nearby Drum Sheds um, shut the spot in January of last year. The quote. Broadwick's mission has always been to build brands that deliver unrivaled live experiences that create real impact to director strategy, Simeon Aldred. We want drum sheds like all spaces to create, uh, we create, sorry, to be new centers of cultural gravity that provide the basis for human connection, a connection that people crave now more than ever. Don't get me wrong, that sounds a bit chat GPT-ish, but I believe them. From what they've done with those former venues are listed above, beams, print works and shit, You can't deny Broadwick Live know how to run a venue. They know how to run a big space. They know how to program them. They know how to, you know, just, you know, just the production side of it, right? I can't imagine how much work it takes to make sure the lights stay on in places like that. Like the sound sounds semi-decent. The equipment works. Like it must be a tall order. And the amount of staff, the sheer amount of staff that work under their banner, it must be insane. So credit to them for doing that because I still think it's a skill, you know, for as much as I would love for all places to be dingy, exposed brick wall warehouses, you know, with crazy fucking, you know, wall of speakers and shit, let's be real and say there also needs to be a space for these kind of normy places that people can go to where if you want to have a food, you know, you want to have a hot dog, you can have it, you can have a dance, you can have a nice cocktail, you can sit down, there's good Wi Fi and shit, you need that sort of stuff to exist, right? It looks good on the Instagram, those need to exist, but I just feel like nowadays, London's kind of been known for that for a long time. We've kind of done that very well. But I think one thing we haven't done very well is really invest in the long-term future of these kind of small to medium-sized clubs from like 200 to 750 capacity in various places in London. Because at the moment, as great as Fold is, 
you know, it still has its issues, still has its problems, it's not perfect, but there should be ones or twos of those in each part of London to kind of, I feel like, ease the pressure on places like that so that they can take more chances. Because at the moment, you can't really take a lot of chances if you're forward because you have to pay the bills, you have a, you know, you have to keep your punters happy and shit, and just you're not going to meet people's expectations. But I feel like if you spread the load out a little bit across of London, then maybe maybe the burden of responsibility can fall on different people you'd hope so anyway that would be the major hope on that one um let's scroll down here what more pictures on the inside it looks very shiny loads of glass as you can see here loads of metal and stairs it's all looking very bleak and boring to be completely honest not the kind of place that i would probably go to anytime soon myself but i'm probably not the target demographic so it doesn't really matter but the you know the building itself if you've been in london you know what the former ikea spot in tottenham looks like i went there once to buy some stuff for the house and shit it kind of is what it is um and you know it's gonna be clearly a good place to kind of do music with because i think usually these places are well heat insulated which i i think again talking about my house here that would do really well for fucking sound so it's definitely going to sound amazing just because of whatever was host housed in there before but pff, the last thing i want to do is be in a fifteen thousand capacity venue mate the last thing i want to be there is with around that many people it's just too much and just in general most likely if you're going to have a fifteen thousand capacity venue the programming is not going to be the most you know not 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 to my taste anyway it's gonna to have to appeal to normies and you know i'd rather jump off the nearest cliff to be honest and there's not many cliffs in the uk so you can just imagine my um you know how <laughs> how much i don't want to do that anyway let's move on from that one and let's talk about this this is courtesy of mix this is actually some good news actually on the smaller club sort of scene type of thing right this is kind of mix mag it says the title here Bradley Zero and Nathaniel Williams launch new hi-fi buy in Tottenham, Moco. One thing that's funny though, when you look at the picture of these two guys, if ever you wanted two people to represent what owning a hi-fi bar, hi bar looked like, it'd be these two. Don't they, don't they look like two guys that would own a hi-fi bar? Like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Just looking at them, they just look like those two guys. But in general, I think it's awesome because they have another one which i still haven't been to the first one called jumbi and that's been doing absolute bits i think they actually celebrated their first year anniversary i can't believe it from the first time i covered them on the fucking pod when they first launched this year and said how amazing it sounded till now it's already been one year like time goes by so flipping fast let me just double check my phone here i'm pretty sure it's been one year yeah i featured it what i think i featured them Oh no, okay, I, I must have not made a clip about it, but essentially they've been open for a year. So big up Jumbi and big up them for doing that. But let's read the article. It says Bradley Zero and Nathaniel Williams um, have launched a new venture in Tottenham called Moco, called Moco, sorry, now this new one. The new Hi Fi bar will open its doors for the first time on Friday, the 18th of August, which is coming up. So if you're around London, definitely go check it out. This follows the launch of their popular, successful Peckham based bar called Jumbi. So they've got one in North, one in South, sorry, at the moment, one in North. And Tottenham, if you don't know anything about London, then you'd know that you wouldn't know that that area of Tottenham is where a lot of the warehouses that are, you know, ha you know, that house the kind of the funky, hipstery, uh, <laughs> cool kids are. They all kind of live in those sort of areas. Cause I think before it was, hackney week but then now because i think a lot of the demolition and renovation work a lot of those warehouse spaces have gone so they're now all kind of gone to those spaces because there's a lot of kind of open space and industrial spaces and warehouses that they can kind of convert into temporary living spaces and i'm sure a lot of the property guardianship things run around that area too so not the best community not the best um transport or you know links but when it comes to finding different spaces and shit interesting places to do cool things in whether it's a hi-fi bar or have your own store or flip in a restaurant or whatever it may be or just you know live there or a studio definitely those places are places to go or maybe further out than that as well they definitely exist it continues back to the article muku or muku moko how do you pronounce it muku or moko i'm gonna say moko moko offers a similar setup to jumbi bringing the same one deck hi-fi restaurant meets blues car party concept across the river from peckham 
the quote for those in the know the word moco is synonymous with jumbi the team explained on social media primarily known as a stilt walker character performed at carnival the word traces its origins to west africa as an or what as an orisha god of retribution moko is the ying of jumbi's yang a character that exists in caribbean folklore as a healer a protector deity in contrast to jumbi's spirit and archetypal trickster so essentially this is like a what a caribbean juju music bar in a way right it's kind of wild right they kind of they kind of you know on on paper promoting caribbean juju in the hopes of getting people to i don't know to play fucking some what's her name lady saw or something tune right <laughs> honestly man you gotta love fucking music people absolutely <laughs> incredible I'm fucking on this. Um, let's see some of the pictures here. You see the guys here standing in front of this amazing, amazing looking speakers and also a whole back section full of fucking vinyl. The idea behind music listening bar things is quite cool. Um, I've kind of known about it mostly because of my infatuation with like Japanese Tokyo culture and shit. And I know they've got a lot of those things over there because they have a huge scene of audio files over there who just incredibly nerdy and geeky and obsessed with the best audio, um, the best speakers, the best turntables, the best whatever when it comes to music listening. And they create these really amazing, cool, chill sort of like spaces where people can just go and sit drink cocktails you know listen to core music you know in a sort of deep way intimate way without all the mixing and the tricking and the effects and the smoke machines and shit and it being one record at a time it also reminds me of the old paradise garage days right the david mancuso days right the idea of kind of just cultivating the space playing amazing tunes providing people with the soundtrack but just taking it very slow playing the whole record out no mixing flipping on one deck like all that stuff is fucking amazing so i love all that about it um and also providing like a different sort of tempo from a club so if you want to if you want kind of club quote unquote music maybe you won't listen to this on your headphones day to day but you'll listen to it in a rich sound you know system have some drinks in the bar then i guess a listening bar is the best option for it um, the flyer also is really cool. I think their art direction has been on point since they've launched Jumbi and obviously this bar called Moko. I think they've done a good way of doing it. Um, as you can see there, they've got the opening weekend happening. Um, let's continue here. Uh, let's actually read the Instagram caption. It says... Um, from SE15 to N15, we invite you to join us on Friday and Saturday from 8 p.m. till late. It's free. There'll be special guest DJs and free drinks and finger foods for the first visitors. So be there early. Um, housed in the 1087 complex, just a short walk from Seven Sisters Tube. The venue holds a legacy of the previous local institution of the place, five miles, and craving um, to provide such a needed space for communities in and around the area. Okay, cool. I've never heard of this 1087 space, but that sounds interesting. Much like our beloved jumbi okay they've got the flags there the booth built from oak wood um solid oak sorry but one of by one of leading london's leading designers don heston and illuminated by a person called lucas sensory will house a community vinyl library which will be home to regular contribution from our guests and residents we open late every night from tuesday to saturday for now um and entry is always free i don't like how they never just say the time that they again this is another little kind of nitpicky thing from london for some reason, London clubs hate putting out set list because I think the idea behind it is that most people want to see the headliner. But if you're a promoter or if you're a venue owner, you want to make sure people stay and drink and get high for the majority of the night. So you don't put out set list in the hopes that people dumb enough will think to arrive at 11 and hope to see the fucking headlining DJ play at 12. That's what you basically do. But I feel like nowadays, most people are educated ravers. They know what they want. They know what they want to see. If you're going to arrive early, you're going to arrive early, regardless of who's playing. And if you're going to come late, you're going to come late. But you can help me inform my decision by just giving me the set list so I know who's playing and who's not. Most of the time, you don't. You just you kind of have to look at the, the decks and then it's all dark and it's, you know, whatever. And you have to kind of go through the crowd to figure out who's playing. It's just annoying. I wish they would kind of just put out set lists. And the other thing I don't like is this insistence on not saying what time things close so it's just open late every night it's like what does that mean it's late 12 it's late one it's late two is it three is it four is it five is it six like just tell me what time it is it doesn't matter like but i guess you know the mystery is important on what time is it going to close is it my last drink or can i order more it's like ugh, enough 
Anyway, we continue. We're also taking our coffee very seriously, holding us high standards of, by cravings. Um, set by cravings, sorry, working with a state, state-of-the-art um, Sineso equipment, um, specialty roasters and trained baristas. No person shall be left uncaffeinated. Okay, cool. So that's nice as well. So they'll have cocktails. They'll have, you know, they'll have fucking good coffees, good music. You can't complain. The venue is due to shop and make, sorry, the venue is set to, set up shop on Tottenham's Markfield Road where former nightclub five miles was forced to close 2020 one man's you know misery another man's fucking glory much of our beloved Jimmy will shining light on the sounds and flavors of Afro-Caribbean diaspora the community setting just sorry the contemporary setting with audiophile sound courtesy of London's based um this book audio studio friendly pressure um so as well as offering free entry mocha is also served to specialty coffee and resident chefs are going to be there every Tuesday and Saturday from 12 p.m. to 10 p.m. So they tell you about the food times, but they don't tell you when the DJs are playing. Fucking annoying. Local celebration launches us on 18th and 19th, 8 p.m. until late, as per usual. No set time. Do special guest DJ sets, free drinks and finger foods. So yeah, check it out if you want. I'll probably end up going there sometime along the day. Um, it looks really cool. It looks really nice. Um, it's interesting because I don't think I've ever actually seen bradley zero dj in irl i don't think so um and again most of it just comes from this weird divide that seems to exist between like south and east because i feel like whenever i imagine or think of bradley zero's music or sets i kind of just imagine you know stuff that's happening down in south and peckham and shit when i wasn't really going there especially you know because i just mostly was hanging around the east and i was too lazy to go down to south and i didn't want to have to get an uber all the way back home after fucking 12 or whatnot because the night buses were taking long and there was no fucking overground but then it also kind of, kind of for me in my head, links a lot to NTS, which I've never listened to. I don't know if you guys are the same, but I feel like I'm, a, you know, somewhat immersed in the scene. I go to a lot of clubs. I love a lot of music. I DJ myself, but I legitimately have never listened to a single radio show on NTS. I don't even know how they start. I, you know what I mean, I know they've got a site. They probably have an app that, that works pretty well. But I think that whole South scene, for some reason, it might, it might be in my head, but I feel like they kind of, you know, latched onto that whole online radio thing way better than I did. Um, or maybe even East, because the one I'm talking about, I swear the fucking head office or the HQ is in fucking Dawson, isn't it? So maybe I'm maybe I'm just the odd one out, but I feel like I've always missed out on that sound particularly because of that. And then I think thirdly, I don't know, there was just, whenever I looked at the guy, I just kind of imagined it would be somebody that I wouldn't like. I don't know why it is. Maybe it's because of the South thing. You know, there's lots of arts unis down there. They all kind of take themselves a little bit too seriously. Maybe it's that kind of vibe. I'm not really too sure. Maybe, maybe there's something in it, but I'm sure they're all lovely people. I'm sure the space is flipping amazing. And ju judging by the success of the first one and clearly them opening the second one, it's clear to see. But, you know, as great as this is, it's just annoying that we don't get the same sort of enthusiasm put behind fucking nightclubs. They don't want to give us nightclubs, but they give us listening bars. Yeah, you know I mean, it's just a little bit annoying. I'd love to kind of go all the way and have everything, you know, a couple of new clubs, a couple of listening bars. I think that will help to kind of, odd, weirdly enough, it'll help to alleviate some of the issues that are happening with our services in terms of police, in terms of ambulances. They'll see a lot of those things, you know, chill out a bit if they kind of spread the load across all these little venues. But, you know, I don't know jack shit here i am talking in this small room with this weird angled fucking webcam i don't know what the fuck i'm talking about jeremy you know I mean? i'm just a fucking idiot so i'll just leave it to the experts and i'll just keep ranting into the wind <laughs> ranting into the wind um uh, moving on from that we talked talk, we talk about that already oh let's talk about this guys this, this is this is pretty interesting so this is courtesy of the shade bar right and i thought this was an interesting topic to kind of speak about because <laughs> i don't know like i generally hate like dating topics and all that sort of stuff because i think it's redundant and i think unfortunately in the podcasting space content creation space especially with you know us blacks we tend to kind of go to these topics because we don't you know know what else to talk about right we don't really have the gumption to try other things so we go for the things that most people will connect with which is kind of you know love relationships marriage family whatever we all kind of share that universal story but it can kind of get a bit tiresome but i saw this random quote randomly on flipping shade borough and it actually made me pause because it made me think imagine if you were actually in a position to try and approach Leo or no you, you manage in position to actually approach Leomi because the first thing is to say Leomi Anderson obviously is one of the premier UK models here um 
I kind of know her specifically, if I'm not mistaken, wasn't she on like a TV show, like a competition for models? I think that's why I kind of are familiar with her when she was really young. I think if I'm not mistaken, there was some sort of talent show thing, if I'm not mistaken. But most recently she's been known for just doing her own thing. She's got her own brand. She's also famous for dating Lancey Foe, who's a big rapper here. And it's kind of bursting and becoming a little bit more popular overseas due to TikTok, funnily enough, which is great to see. But she recently announced that they have kind of broken up or not kind of they are. So she's single now. And she posted this tweet, which I thought was hilarious, right? She says the following, people will mess up and be like, quote unquote, let's talk. If you don't go and buy me a Chanel bag or roses and a trip to Jamaica, what is there to talk about? And it's a bit blunt. It's a bit flippant. It might be a bit of a troll because she does like a little bit of a joke. She's a bit of a jester online. She doesn't take herself too seriously, but it does put into real clear black and white <laughs> how challenging it must be trying to follow up on what Lancey Foe must have been doing. You know, pause, no home or whatever I need to say after that to not make me sound like a cuck, right? Imagine how difficult it must be to try and follow up that adventure that they were on. Because they're essentially like on some, they're on some fucking Bonnie and Clyde thing, in it, right? Two rock star guys in the, you know, in the fucking peaks of that, no, coming up in the scene, super young, you know, on that journey from being relatively unknown to being big stars in their own right. I felt like as well from the outside looking in, I didn't feel like there was a, a power imbalance either. It kind of felt like they were both kind of, you know, no one was too far ahead of each other on in either part of their journey, which kind of helped to probably not stir up any thoughts of, you know, jealousy and shit. And they got money, they got famous, they blew up, um, traveled the world, took amazing pictures together, you know, did amazing things. <laughs> now they've broken up and some other guy now has to try <laughs> and match the pace or whatever else is offered and you think about it right Lancey Fo is one of the biggest or better artists that we have coming up now from the quote-unquote underground scene right the thing that isn't UK rap or that isn't drill but by default that means he then gets invited to things that only someone that does the things that he does will get invited to so <laughs> even if you've got means you can't est- you know there's certain things you just won't be invited to go to or you won't be able to go to because maybe you're working and shit so it just really kind of limits the amount of people that she can probably date who can offer her that sort of lifestyle but it's also very challenging to whoever the guy is that takes up that challenge because even if you've got the money can you actually really do it (laughs) like day to day like is it actually possible but then the other side of me thought to myself like i really do understand the city girl mentality because there is an aspect of it that's a little bit you know kind of fooling yourself because you know you're basically saying you're happy to live this life and this is all you want when really sometimes you're maybe looking to live that life for the time being and then when somebody great comes along you're willing to change it up but you know whatever say what you want to say about it i understand it in the sense of there's always somebody out there that's going to be willing ready and able to pay no, to kind of not pay to kind of um, satisfy your needs whatever that may be in that city girl lifestyle so I'm, i also understand why some girls don't want to sell i get it because if you're you know if you're leomi why would you settle for less when you've had what you've had before like you know there's no need to because you've had it once so if you've had it once i mean it's possible it's like with all dreams it's like with all fucking you know with everything we sort of chase in life the fact that some what one person did it should be enough proof for you that you could do it too. You should never be kind of limited um, to the limits of your imagination. Like if somebody has done it and, you know, and that's a human, (laughs) then you should be able to do it also. So I understand why she doesn't want to, you know, why should I settle for some guy that's going to take me to Nando's when I had this guy fly me out to Cabo or to fucking Paris to come and meet him for a day and then fly me back again? Like, why would I do that? So I completely understand it. But it then puts another sort of slant in it. I should think of the made you think guy said here in the comment that a lot of this is very shallow and very materialistic, which is concerning because it looks like people sort of view materialism as a form of love or as the same thing as love when it isn't. It's, it's different, but it's not the same thing. And they read, and I think unfortunately, the only can 
to say what she says here because she's in like let's say the top five percent of people in terms of money wealth attractiveness and access and shit so you can afford to say that because most likely you're going to meet somebody who can fulfill your desires but regular people most regular people who follow her especially women they don't have that you know luxury but they view these people and see that those people are living that way and expect that in their regular life when that's not regular <laughs> right it's not it just isn't um that's the only other thing but again it's not her concern she shouldn't be worrying about what people think and how they view their relationships and blah 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 and putting unfair expectations of people but it does need to be highlighted i think he even said it here this comment from made you think 101 great instagram page check them out um they said respect and principles shouldn't have a price or tie to materials gifts and money are great when it's coming from a great place but shouldn't trade it for respect and your principles which I definitely understand and definitely get 100%. But again, if you've had it before and you can have it again, why not? Um, thoughts and prayers go out to the boys or the ladies, whoever there may be, they may follow up on Lancey and try and make that work. But I don't envy you in that position, mate. I do not envy you. Moving on, we've got this topic to quickly talk about here regarding um, legendary, legendary Mashtown um, rapper and all around East London legend, um, Hypo R.I.P. Unfortunately, he was um, stabbed up, I think a couple of years ago, maybe a year ago at a party, unfortunately so, especially when you kind of remember all the good things he was trying to do and trying to kind of shed his former life and live a somewhat calm existence. Maybe some of the stuff that he did in the past caught up with him at this party, but the more disturbing part of it was that it was actually a security guard so somebody that was hired to help keep the peace was the one that was essentially responsible for killing hypo at this party and courtesy of the shade bird they said the security guard is on the trial for the murder of rapper hypo the caption says the trial into the murder um, of Hypo, formerly known as Lamar Jackson, has begun. The rapper was fatally stabbed last June at a birthday party in Watford um, Town FC. The rapper is said to have shouted, I've been stabbed before he collapsed on the floor. A security guard known as Laurie John Philip 33 denies murdering Hypo despite handing himself in, claiming to act in a lawful self defense. So he's claiming that maybe Hypo tried to stab him first or whatever and then he kind of just you know self-defense sort of thing but either way a, a ridiculous situation to be in why a security guard is going to a party where they hide at and carrying a knife with them i don't really know maybe there's a reason to it because of the people that go there but i just think it's insane that security guard would have that sort of thing on them in the first place and also be on that sort of time um but i'm interested to see what does happen and what sort of kind of concludes as a trial kind of goes on or what sort of things come out during the trial and um, maybe some details we aren't really familiar with that kind of come to light that will maybe shine this in a different light and maybe we'll be able to understand what actually happened but again really sad because you know hyper was going on somewhat of a he was going down a good path, I felt like, from the stuff I've seen even online. Because I remember bumping into him here and there in East and stuff. And he was always on go time. And it looked like he was trying to make a change. And, you know, again, growing up in the East, like, there wasn't a lot of people that were kind of doing the American thing in the UK way, the way he was doing it in terms of the, you know, the, the fucking designer clothes, the big shiny diamonds, whether they're real or not, it doesn't matter. Like, he was doing it in a big way back in the day and that kind of put him on and you know he was kind of i don't know i always kind of viewed him as like um the jim jones of mashtown right he kind of started off as like the the goon in a way but then because he was not because he was you know cool with the gang they kind of hey um jump on the mic you, you, you're always funny you got clever one-liners and shit and that kind of translated into him just being like a like a kind of a like a stunt rapper or something do you know what i mean it wasn't even that serious but he just always sounded really good on the mic because you know it really was what he was talking about he really did um you saw the evidence of it outside you saw the way he was moving you saw the cars he was driving him asco and that and what they were doing back in the day was amazing free asco as well it's absolutely crazy to see how it all ended and transpired um he didn't deserve to go out that way i feel like and um yeah let's hope see what what kind of transpires as the trial goes on in these next few days but yeah r.i.p hypo gone too soon man definitely definitely gone too soon then we have to move on and talk about <laughs> nick kerrigos's um nick kirigos that's how you pronounce his name right kirigos's back tattoo i've just seen this recently and it's amazing because i feel like in one way as horrible as it is his back tattoo 
it's also quite cool because I feel like we're getting into we're getting to a place now in culture where it's acceptable to have your own personal style of tattoo. However gaudy and horrible it looks, no one looks down upon it. I feel like there's a period in time where everyone's trying to get the best, coolest, trendiest tattoo from the best, coolest artist. But over time, you know, that's kind of gone away and people just want to express their own individuality and personality through their tattoos. Whether that includes getting fucking, you know, manga stuff, anime stuff, or Pokemon all over their body. And it's exactly what fucking Nick Kyrgios has got because I guess he's a big Pokemon fan. He got an amazing mural on his entire back. If you can't see the picture, it's basically covering his entire back of all these different Pokemons. Um, you've got, I've got I mean, you've got the evolution of Squirtle, you've got the evolution of Charizard, and some others I don't really recognize here, but that cover his entire back. And it's done really well, don't get me wrong, it's done incredibly, incredibly well. You see some earlier line work here, and then you see it again filled in, and it's black and white on his back, it looks incredible. I think I prefer it black and white than being color. Color would have taken too long. And look how many people are working at the same time, by the way. There's like four guys working on his back tattoo filling it in at the same time i can't imagine the pain but yeah that's him getting the tattoo on his back it looks fairly cool don't get me wrong very 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 him because it's random as hell but it's also fucking awful and ugly it kind of reminds me a little bit of um what's his face what's that guy's name that's married to fucking j-lo i don't remember his name now um what's his name jennifer lopez's husband I forgot his fucking name. What's his fucking name? He's got a really bad tattoo too. What's his name? Ben Affleck? Yeah, Ben Affleck. Ben Affleck's back tattoo is fucking gawful too. Him is a, his is like a dragon, I think. <laughs> I think it's like a dragon or something. Yeah, that's it. Ben Affleck's tattoo is so random. This random white guy has this random rainbow looking um, Japanese type looking tattoo on his back. And of course, he's just built like a regular dad and he has this fucking god awful tattoo on his back that makes little to no sense. And most likely that tattoo wraps around his bum. So it looks like he's got a proper Yakuza type of style of tattoo where it kind of, it goes across his, his little left bum cheek here somewhere. But yeah, that Nick Kyrgios tattoo kind of reminds me a little bit of Ben Affleck's awful back tattoo that he has in combination of voice. Because you can see this one on his arm with the cross that definitely is an earlier tattoo that you get we don't have much money because the lines aren't as clear and it looks a little bit crap from a distance um but then yeah you got some other things here going on so big up ben affleck anyway you know it's good to have a bit of personality in the artwork you're doing this like i said it's good to see nowadays quite clearly there is a kind of trend of people deciding to get their own little version of a tattoo and not kind of doing the trendy thing and saying, hey, this is the stuff that I'm into. I don't care what you guys think. I like this shit. It kind of my vibe. Um, and if you don't like it, suck my dick type of vibe, which I'm down for. So big up Nick Kyrgios and big up Ben Affleck for being themselves and having a bit of personality. We love to see it. Cracking on, let's talk about the Doja Cat again. Doja Cat is out here annoying fans <laughs> annoying everybody really with this one woman mission to essentially burn the boats which i have to love and i can't hate because i am somebody who you know i'm a fan of chaos or chaos principle in general right i love the idea of just being purposely <laughs> annoying and trying to kind of you know stir up trouble just for the sake of it just because you know why not life is boring day to day why not try and make things a little bit interesting by you know mixing things up a little bit i'm not really that you know i you know i don't mind it i don't mind a little bit of chaos fear in life i think that keeps you a little bit honest but i have to be honest with this and say i'm a little bit bored with this whole doja cat trying to paint herself as a victim narrative going on because it's not that deep i don't think so personally I feel like, yes, some of her fans were being annoying and they were having weird, you know, parasocial relationships with her that she clearly wasn't comfortable with. I understand it. But I think most fans aren't like that. That's just a very small contingency of your fan base. That's why people call them stands because stands are make up a majority of anyone's fan base, even Nicki Minaj, even big TikTok artists, gen you know, most generic, sorry, most general fans normally fans who like you just like you for what you put out they might want to say hi they might want to autograph but that's where it starts and that's where it stops so it's never that deep i feel like some of the fans just went into acknowledgement and just wanted they just wanted 
kind of a reciprocation, right? They went to feel as if like the love that they put in for supporting her, she was somehow reciprocating back, but I guess she was in a bad mood and she didn't want to feel like she was being told to do anything or whatever it may be. Who knows? But either way, I'm just bored of it. So there's this recent article, Curtis of Harper's Bazaar, where Doja Cat did an amazing, um, you know, cover story and interview with it. She looks fantastic in clothes. I think everyone can say she knows how to take a fucking good pose picture. She can pose her fucking ass off. She looks great in clothes. Um, and and yeah, she just, you know, the camera loves Doja Cat. We can't deny that. She looks fucking incredible in everything that she wears for the most part. No one can deny. So um, I want to get to some of her answers regarding how she feels about the fans and stuff as you scroll by some of the pictures on the shoot. And here it is. So it starts off here. Here's the question, right? You definitely push boundaries. Why do you think people go crazy when you do things like shave your head or your eyebrows? Before she answers, I will say, I don't think people go crazy. It's just surprising to most people out there because I think most people maybe project a little bit and think, hey, if I look like Doja Cat, would I purposely try and uglify myself or man repeller myself to kind of divert the male gaze? Probably not, right? Most people wouldn't do that. They look at Doja Cat, they think she's a gorgeous woman and think, you know what? Why is she doing this to herself? This is weird, she's shocking. But that's where it starts and that's where it ends. It's not that deep. I think she's also looking into it way deeper than what it actually is. Most people just, you know, say it because, you know, when you bleach your eyebrows or you shave your head, it's kind of a radical look. You're going, especially if you're a woman, you know, cutting off all your hair is a big thing. Um, there's a lot of symbolism behind, you know, the hair in general. And obviously women have a lot of attachments and a lot of, you know, of their identity is tied up in how they look and their hair and stuff. So when you cut that off, it shouldn't be surprising that regular people that don't know you just from the outside of just seeing you, it could be a little bit of a shock to get used to. Same thing if your fucking dad you grew up with decides to cut off his mustache one day because he's feeling cute. It can get take time to get to get used to it, right? Look at some of the videos out there that exist of toddlers, you know, reaction to their dad shaving their fucking moustache it can be quite traumatic so you know it's not that big of a deal but also you have to understand why people are maybe sometimes shocked because you know it's just not what they're used to seeing from people who look like Doja Cat going out of the way to do but again let's go to her answer Doja Cat's answer about why do you think people go crazy when she shaves her head and eyebrows Doja Cat says my theory is that if someone has never met me in real life then subconsciously I'm not real to them so when some people, so when people become engaged with someone they don't even know on the internet, they kind of take ownership over that person. <laughs> they think that that person belongs to them in some way. And when that person changes drastically, there is a shock response that is almost uncontrollable. I've accepted that that's what happens. So I put my wigs on and take them off. I shave my head or my eyebrows. I have all the freedom in the world. Now, I think again she's bugging. I don't think it's that deep. I think most people root for their favorite artist the way that anybody would root for their favorite team. It's just somebody they love and support and you want to see them shine and do well. I don't think anybody has an image. No, actually, maybe people do. Maybe we all have images of people of how they are and then it changes when you meet them in real life. I think we even have that with some people that are members of our family that we don't probably know too well. You have an idea of what they're like, then you meet them in person and then, you know, they either confirm, dispel or they confuse. It's just one of those things. So it's not too surprising that that tends to happen to her online. I just feel like for some reason, she seems to be wrestling with the idea of being a celebrity a lot, clearly, because from what I've been able to gauge online and from things I've heard, you know, through different people, even someone like a house phone who said he was around Doja Cat early on and stuff. She's always wanted to be famous. She's always wanted to be an artist. She's always wanted to be signed on a label, all that stuff, right? Popular. It's always been a plan of hers and it never kind of worked out along the way. There's many videos of her you can see of her freestyling and shit when she's younger, trying to make it. And, you know, it finally has made it, but maybe her idea of what fame would be of what being a pop star would be is different to what it is in the day to day. And she's having trouble kind of coming to grips with it, which is understandable. And then she also lives in like, you know, this era with Stan culture and shit. It makes sense why she's kind of a little bit conflicted, but she needs to relax. She needs to really does need to relax and take it easy. Most fans just want to feel like the support that they're putting into her is somehow replic rep replicate replicated in some ways or, or reciprocated sorry in the sense that you know she's acknowledging them she's thanking them for their support because in a weird way i feel like the ownership thing is, is interesting that she mentioned that because in a weird way fans taking ownership of 
pushing you, promoting you and talking about you all the time can sometimes help with your career to get you noticed. But then I guess in some way, she's also saying that after a while, it can get annoying because they then feel like they are responsible for your success, which I know just hearing it sounds fucking ridiculous because you're the artist. If you didn't, if you didn't exist, they wouldn't exist. So it's like, no, you're actually the most important person. But in this day and age where there's like a million artists, you have to admit too, fans do play a big role in people's success. If you don't have fans, you have to rely on the label and the machine to kind of pop you forward. And no one wants to be, you know, no one wants to be a plant anyway. But you can't deny the fans' influence and part that they play in people's success. So in some ways, you kind of have to kiss the ring from time to time and just keep them sweet or just be cordial in, in you know you can think what you want to think privately but i think in public it just it doesn't hurt to just be cordial and let them know how much you've you know so you know, appreciate their support because in general if the fans stop fucking with you you don't have a career and i don't think those just going to be making music for no money especially after having money and fame then going back to having no money and fame is not gonna happen so all the stuff that she says can sometimes feel like she's full of shit because if you don't like it, then stop making the music and go back to working a regular job. Do you know what I mean? It's not that deep really, but I guess this era of musicians are just conflicted overall and it's just, they're just processing in real time. And also I can't imagine how it must be to be a star of her level nowadays at that age. You know what I mean? It just must be a whole different challenge day to day to kind of make that work so i have sympathy for her in some respects but i do think it's getting a little bit boring hearing her talk about how much she hates her fans like okay we get it like move on um what else it says here what uh, what do you imagine is next for you she says there are all kind of projects i want to branch into uh, I want to, oh, of course, every every musician does this. Every self, she says, I want to explore making clothes, dabbling makeup, and I want to explore acting. Of course, you do. Everyone wants to do acting. I would love to do movies that I believe in. I would have to step in, stop me doing music for a minute, but I would be down to immerse myself in acting for a certain period of time. Um, I want to learn martial arts and be in a film like John Wick. Is it true that you do stand? You could do a handstand. No, that you want to do stand up. It's something I've definitely considered. I actually went on stage recently with Craig Robinson. He would get on the piano and I'd just play songs, but he'll do his own thing. In the funny ass way, I went on stage and sang with him at the comedy club. <laughs> oh, at a comedy club. Sorry, I was super low key, but I was there with one of my boyfriends. Lowell's at one of my boyfriends. So yeah, that's cool. That's that's pretty funny to be fair. To to end an answer talking about comedy with a joke, or maybe it's not a joke. Who knows? But for sure, one thing we can be certain all of these boyfriends are caucasian which i think again this is something that's really odd for me because usually i don't care about this sort of stuff because i'm all about the art but i have to admit like maybe because it's a personal thing but it's always irked me this whole like i only date white guys thing she's never said it but judging by her slew of boyfriends they all look white so you know it's safe to say that doja doesn't fuck with black people or black boys sorry not people black boys i'll take that back which you might have a reason to right i think you're allowed to have conflicted somewhat problematic opinions of your own race if you've had really bad experiences because she's mixed race right so imagine if her father whoever is mixed in her parents so whoever's black in her you know what side of parent they are imagine if that person's a real piece of shit and caused them nothing but heartache and trouble it's okay for her to also carry that into her personal life and think you know what i don't want nothing to do with no black guy because this black guy but you know a, a black guy who happened to be my dad broke my mom's heart destroyed my family stole money did this did this i can understand it but still a part of me just get can't get past how lame and almost weird it is to say you only date white people i've got i've got that a lot with some people especially when i used to meet girls out and about and you know sometimes if it was a caucasian lady that say something like yeah i'm only really into black guys i only date black dudes and in the moment you just entertain the conversation because you know you're a boy and you have your needs but it would always make me fucking it always make my skin crawl it always give me the ick hearing somebody say they only date black it's like what is what does that even mean so you're completely cutting yourself from from everybody else who isn't that race because what because you're fetishizing black people because you think they have a it's just whatever it's just bizarre to me how people can limit themselves to only one race in terms of dating everyone's got preferences i understand that but completely ruling people out is bizarre um personally i just don't really understand what that's about and um there must be something also in the fact that not not to be offensive also but a lot of her kind of white boyfriends are like 
what you would say mid, right? Looking wise. So I wonder if there's this sort of like, I wonder, man, because she's obviously attractive. I wonder if there's this, um, self loathing sort of aspect to it where you purposely go for like, you know, you, you shed yourself of whatever, you know, trinkets and attractiveness bits that you had about you that men liked. So you shed yourself of the male gaze. Then you persic, then you purposely only go for a certain type of dude. And then you specifically go for a certain type of dude, a certain type of race, but also that looks a certain type of way. Like somebody that you, some, most people wouldn't expect you to be into. So it's sort of like, you know, again, like unconventional, look at me, don't look at me type of thing. Because you, I'd imagine most people, if they saw Doja Cat walking down the street with her boyfriends, they'd, they'd double take, not because, you know, she's there obviously, but because of the contrast, like rah, that boy looks like a fucking gargoyle and you look like that. How did that happen? So I can understand that side of things, but I don't know. There's just something about it that just kind of irks me the wrong way. Um, she said the following. Um, one of my boyfriends is funny. She says, yeah, I love, I love, love. I'm possibly a serial data. I definitely have had in me a little bit, but right now I'm in a different place in my life where I'm very committed and very much in love in a different way than before. I think I've evolved. I'm learning to love myself. So the way that I love other people is very different. I don't feel like I've lost a little, t I don't feel like a lost little teen. I like, I love, I feel like a woman who is coming into her own. So yeah, fair play to her. The shoot, like I said, looks amazing. Dojo is cat's always going to stun when it comes to putting on a good outfit and taking a good picture she's very very photogenic and just generally knows how to pose and sort of like manipulate her body in a great way on camera and just great i love all of it but yeah there's something about the constant fucking i hate my fans thing that's kind of a little bit boring in my personal opinion but again i could be wrong and i could be chatting on my own ass who knows who bloody knows then we have to talk a little bit about this as well i thought this was hilarious um oh and then of course we need to talk a little bit about supreme spring summer 2023 mate supreme spring summer 2023 has dropped the previews out so is the lookbook and we need to go through every single piece of this so i can give you my review i'm so fucking excited about this dropping so it's going to be dropping by the time you're listening to this you would have probably seen it or touched some of it in the shops as it's dropping right now i'm actually going to get up on here let's put supreme drops is it on here let's where is it supreme drops on twitter let's see if we can find them they always come to put in a good lip list together of all the stuff that's going to be actually in stores but from what i've seen the full list of stuff happening in week one is crazy the amount of stuff that's dropping is really really nuts all the big heaters i've actually like are dropping on that same day so unfortunately for my bank account it's going to be a very very expensive first day buying some stuff online and shit so as you can see here the full drop list is there you've got a whole bunch of items dropping um as you can see on this list as the thing loads up bear with me a second we've got loads of stuff here let me actually pro let me actually get that first picture up so you can see here so the list of stuff is just insane <laughs> to be honest from the spring summer 2023 collection but it's fucking stacked and i don't know about you i don't know about you but i feel like over the years fall winter for supreme was always the best personally for me but i feel like ever since supreme has become main you know become somewhat of a mainstream brand a lot of normies know about supreme like you know your mum will probably have heard about it because of the cues or whatnot and most of the kids that you know in and around your area probably wear it also so it's become a little bit more quote-unquote commercial but i feel think it's kind of held on to its sort of cool edgy you know counterculture setting the trend pushing the pushing the line type of brand which i always love about it and i feel like over time now the whole adage behind, oh, four winters the best season isn't true because I feel like they've got way more customers to satisfy. So because of the customers they have to satisfy, they have to produce now at a higher level more consistently. So they can't just rely on, okay, we're going to kill it on winter anymore. It has to be year in, year out. We have to deliver, you know, seven out of 10 to eight out of 10 plus every single season. And I feel like we're seeing that now because this might be one of the best, most consistent spring, summer, 2023 or spring summer collections i've ever seen from supreme in a very very long time so um first things first to talk about i like um this jacket here i'm a big fan of the scott leather jacket that comes in silver and black that definitely something that will get purchased this jacket here that is the shy bori 
denim trucker jacket. I think if I'm not mistaken, there's a kid that works at Supreme who currently has his own brand that does a similar type of patches and stitches and embroidery on his clothing that was very similar so it looks like they roped him in to do his own little collection that isn't a collaboration it's just him basically designing pieces for supreme which is fucking brilliant um so big up him for doing that if i'm not mistaken there's this jacket here which i'm a big fan of this canvas clip jacket again this is very um you know what's this thing called album coded it kind of reminds me of a better version of what drake's does because i feel like drake's that brand is a little bit too yuppie a little bit too white a little bit too caucasian for me um but i feel like these type of jackets with these um sort of fisherman type of vibes outdoory type of vibes done in this kind of way is a great way to kind of have that look maybe wear a pair of sperries a pair of loafers with no socks but also without the wanky drake's wannabe sommelier type of vibe you know what i mean that kind of new yorker hipster tribeca whatever type of vibe thing that i fucking detest so that's not really something that i'd be one to wear but i love that um that jacket with the pin dots so the Gore-Tex uh, Pasolet Lightweight Shell Jacket is beautiful also. Um, it's the same design I think that was available in jackets from previous seasons, so I'm loving that. Um, I'm also liking this Gore-Tex Leather Down Jacket, um, 700 feel. So imagine the shape of that jacket, the size of it, all made in leather in the green and the black is absolutely sublime. Um, and then you've also got, I think... If it looks, if I'm not mistaken, this is kind of a redo also. There's a patchwork jacket here that obviously reverses into a blue puffer jacket that's got a patchwork design, but it's also kind of reminds me of something from a previous season. So I'm liking the look of this. And it also kind of reminds me of the legendary um, Supreme and undercover um, half zip type of anorak thing that Carty wore one time when he was performing on a runway. I think it was like a V file show. Um, that's a legendary jacket so that looks brilliant so i'm a big fan of that also let's actually zoom out a little bit and then talking about carty there's actually the varsity jacket that's back isn't it right that was legendary jacket where is it why can't i can't see it here am i seeing it did i miss it already oh this is actually the wrong thing isn't it this is spring summer 2023 is that the wrong one I think I might have the wrong collection. That's probably why I'm seeing some repeats and stuff from last season. Yeah, there we go. It's fall winter 2023, not spring. See, I'm absolutely messing up. So the spring 2023 collection. So ignore what I said about fucking spring usually being dead, but the winter collection is always the best when it comes to Supreme. So anyway, let's go on that one more time. So one of the better jackets I like is this jacket here with the star, the one that's, what is it called? It's called the star sleeve down puffer jacket. For me, the reason why I really like this because I feel like this is something that Tremaine from Denim Tears would have made or would have lended his ear when it comes to some of the colorways for this because this feels exactly like something that Denim Tears would have done. It kind of reminds me um, of the flipping you know of the flag that he uses by the artist whose name kind of escapes me right now but it looks very similar to that. the only thing that i don't like about it is the fucking supreme on the back but it's something i just have to get used to now most supreme items and clothing are always going to have the fucking you know the word supreme blazing somewhere on the back or the sleeve of it i feel like the star design is enough but i feel like the you know maybe the black is sort of more tonal but the only color to get is definitely the red and the green that colorway is fucking incredible um star seal star sleeve down puffer jacket it's definitely one of my favorites so is this hell jacket actually um the photography is by who it doesn't say the, oh, the photography is oh really it's original by dash snow that's amazing i love how they're incorporating little bits and pieces of dash snow lately in a lot of their collections i think last season we had the we had a fucking maybe a dash snow face or something or something else that was featured so little by little they're doing a lot more to kind of recognize dash snow's sorry dash snow's legacy and influence and part he played in supreme's history so that's great to see this jacket here oh sorry this vest with the pins is awesome um i think a lot of people are debating whether or not the pins are all individually removable or if it's just an effect but i think they all are i think supreme has enough money to manufacture something like this at this level to be completely honest um and it looks fucking brilliant it looks very much like something um nate lauman would wear back in the day if he was hanging around supreme or jason deal or uh, who's the other guy um the other cute dude um Alex Olsen, he'd probably wear something like this, right? It's definitely in that kind of lane of things to wear. Loads of little crate, little badges that Supreme usually do over the years anyway, right? Don't be a dick, don't ask. Um, there's ride my face badge, middle finger badge, triple six badge. 
Um, there's a Sid Vicious drinking beer badge. Like, loads of really cool little badges here on a nice quilted, um, is it quilted, insulated, whatever you'd call these vests. Let me see the description actually, see what they actually say. It says here, pins, quilted work vest, water resistant, quilted, line on with enamel, pins and buttons, and a 3M Finsulate insulation. So yeah, it's definitely going to be quite warm. Nice padded shape, nice boxy shape, can be worn with a two of hoodies and just about everything. Very versatile and easy piece. I'm definitely a fan of that. Also, I'm a big fan of this jacket, which is the featherweight down puffer jacket. Um, for me personally, this might be my favorite jacket of the whole entire collection. It's sort of, it's given me... Um, What's that brand that's kind of the above of Stone Island? Is it like 10C or something? I forgot the name of it, but it's kind of giving me that sort of vibe in terms of the finish. But oddly enough, you know what it does remind me of? It reminds me of this legendary Uniqlo jacket that I regret selling or giving away. I had like three of them. They released when Uniqlo maybe was at the peak of its years and maybe like 2012 or something in London. And he had these amazing down jackets with like V kind of you know stitching on it and they were somewhat reversible but not really but they came in black they came in purple or uh, red and whatever but it had this really amazing sheen shine to it right and this is kind of a similar sort of effect but i also love this lovely pattern um this shape on the inside we've got this big sort of like n you know circular type of shape around the top of the jacket that actually doubles up as two big pockets so you've got one pocket that goes down for your hands and one pocket that goes down here for your chest so you can kind of have your hands sitting up here as you would wearing a fucking bulletproof vest or you were an undercover cop or something i love that it looks fucking brilliant i'm a big fan of this jacket um and obviously the zips extend to the back also i'm not sure if they go all the way around i wonder what the zips are about it says low fairway deck here full zip closure with zip pocket at lower front and half zip stash pockets at cuff interior so i wonder if these are pockets or just just a pattern i wonder what this what this shape is but we'll probably see when people buy it and i love the tonal for me the tonal supreme label or this tonal supreme branding at the bottom is always one of my favorite bits um so i wonder when when someone eventually buys we see online we'll get to see what this is all about but the shape looks incredible and it's got it's got a nice hood on it also they're showing the trapper hat and the gloves. I don't know if they mean the trapper hat and the gloves comes with the jacket. I don't think so. But I wonder why they're showing them together because usually they don't do this. Usually if they have a jacket that has a bottom. You just have to wait to get to the bottoms to check them out. Um, but the, track, the fact that they're showing them together, maybe they come together. I'm not really too sure. Maybe. Maybe they come, they're sold as a pack. But regardless, um, the colors are great. Um, if I had to go for one, oddly enough, I might go for this Lion of Judah red colorway. It's really gaudy. It's really, you know, trashy looking. But I've always loved this fucking pattern anyway in, in general. So I'd probably go for this lion um, red colorway if I had to go for one personally. I really love this. This is fucking beautiful. So yeah, big up Supreme for that one. And let me get off of this. Go back. Watch everything I went to talk about here. We saw that. Um, this um, RL, sorry, HR Greiger jacket is also hard bodied in the green as is as is this camo jacket here this jacket oh it's fucking again the jackets are too much I'd, I'd i'd probably wear every single one the hood design already look at the hood that hood is fucking banging that's covering your mouth and no it's just your eyes looking here you put a shiesty underneath that and you are incognito no one's recognizing you you got this amazing tree bark camo with the supreme here on the sleeve the 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 zip at a slight angle like the nice zips here like just beautiful design like love everything about it the inside yes look the, in white in coke white it looks fucking incredible in black it looks great like i'm all for this man this looks so good so it says here it says um uh, gore-tex 700 field down park that's what i want fucking beautiful it's got breathable gore-tex line on zip is that 700 field interior it's got hand pockets interior elasticated sh shock cord um insulate fix hoodie and velcro tab adjusters too but yeah the hood for me design it's just a fucking real winner here that that hood design you can't go wrong like that is definitely you know rubber bank worthy you know i mean that's definitely stick up kid worthy i'm a big fan of that one so that jackets are good again loads of jackets i've purchased because again jacket season and of course the piece of resistance has to be them reissuing the tiger varsity jacket 
Supreme don't usually do a lot of reissues, especially super popular things. I think one of the other popular varsity jackets was the Supreme and Double Taps varsity from a few years ago. Also, I think it might have been around this time, might have been in twenty, might be even the year before. But um, they don't usually reissue things. Um, I still remember the varsity jacket that I had. I wish they would reissue that um, Supreme World famous let's see if i can go that way it's the one i had i had it in like brown and purple but i had to sell it because it was a little bit tight on me um i think it was like a large but it, it, it might be an excel but it fit it fit more like an like a really small large but it was this varsity jacket that had a embroidery um of the empire state building head that was like lying flat or something right that was kind of looked like it was chopped off or something it was an incredible varsity jacket i think it was where was it if i can find it here Oh, I had it and I sold it many, many years ago. Had the Empire State's head on it. Let's see, Var Supreme. Let's see, Varsity Jacket. Empire. Is it Empire State Building Head? It's from many, maybe they don't have it even. It's from a few years ago. I forgot what the name of it is called. And it's got Supreme World Famous written on the sleeve, like an embroidery. Where is it? Okay. Oh, it's not here. Wow. Maybe it just doesn't exist. Maybe no one's got it. It's that old. It's from way, way, way back. But I'm sure people have had it before. World Hold on, Varsity Jacket. Let's just do World Famous. I think I found it last time like that. It was called World Famous. See if I can get it on here. Not that one. Not this. This is another good one. Actually, that one. But I'm going to find one here. That's the one. Is it the one there? No, it's kind of like Avrex. My bad. It was like a varsity jacket that had this really amazing it was basically the head of the empire states building that it was kind of similar to that sort of color with the brown sleeves but the head had been chopped off and it was sort of like on flat embroidered on the back it looked incredible like really really well done but unfortunately i can't seem to find anyone that's had a had one maybe i'm writing it wrong but anyway regardless to say they don't usually reissue limited edition reissue kind of really legendary jackets like that anymore another one i'd wish they'd kind of reissue actually in this, when it comes to reissuing because i can't find that varsity jacket is this jacket um it was a jacket that had roses on it quilted <clears throat> roses quilted <clears throat> i wish they would reissue this mm, quilted jacket it came in a black and a blue there we go this one i want them to reissue this that's what I wanted to reissue. If they want to reissue something, please, for the love of God, Supreme, reissue this jacket. Um, the Satin Rose Quilted Bomber. I had it in this color. Unfortunately, the one I bought was a fake from fucking, um, I think it might have been Grailed or Depop or something, and I had to sell it. But I'd wish to get another one. This is fucking one of my favorite jackets of all time. Um, Supreme, definitely a grail for me. This, this fucking quilted piece. Absolutely stupendous. I fucking love it. And of course, the last one I'd say, um, Supreme Anorak Aaron Bonder, obviously, the one that he modeled. I had this also, but I had to sell it. This is another thing that I wish they would fucking reissue. Again, from the day, from the era that I was fucking wearing this shit every, think, every freaking day, thinking I was looking like an absolute legend. Is it going to load here? <clears throat> if it doesn't load, we'll just move on to see if I can find it. That's the one, yeah. So the one I would love them to reissue is this. Let's just see if it loads up. Yeah, that's the one. I want them to reissue this 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 jacket that Aaron Bondroff is wearing. Um from this season. I forgot whatever season that was. This Anorak, I've I had this. I wanted to reissue that. And there's another one also that had like a badge on the side of the sleeve that I also had that I thought she had to sell. I think he might be wearing it. One of these pictures, I can't remember which one it was, but it's a supreme anorak with like a badge on the side of it that I really want him to kind of to bring back one time. I think it might be a fisherman. Let's see if I got a fisherman or something. It's like a fisherman jacket. Fisherman. Let's see if I can find it. I think it might be a Parker actually. Fisherman Parker. Let's see if I can find that one. Okay, it's not here, but anyway, you know what I mean. They issue, they don't issue lots of things, but I want them to issue some of the things that I fucking love because 
I'm the most important person here. So anyway, this um, reissue is from, if I'm not mistaken, 2009, if I'm not mistaken, 2009. It's back in 2013 or 2023, sorry. Um, Playboy Carter is obviously one of the people that's known for wearing this, but everybody had this when it first dropped. I think it was, you know, hands down one of the better varsities they've done, especially because they've had a lot of duds, I felt like, with varsities because they're easy to fuck up. But this is very, very well done. You've got the tiger, um, obviously, emblem on the front. You've got the two S's, Supreme. You've got the 23 here. You got these patches that says Tigers. You got one that says Onward to Vicent to Victory, Divine Mercy, um, but Regionals USA nine ninety four. Um, you got yeah, it's just great jacket and obviously Supreme at the back. You got an all black one that I probably wouldn't be a fan of, but the color that definitely go for is this orange color, and this sort of brown burgundy color because that red lining on that brown burgundy just hits so good. So I'm a big fan of that. That's amazing. Even just the color combo of blue, white, and this sort of like brown is fucking gorgeous. So I'm all over this. That's definitely going to be a standout piece. And I assume many people are going to try and buy that over the next few days. So good luck trying to snap a pair, but it's good. It's going to be available again. You've got this great jacket here. Also Gore-Tex 700 applied down with the clips on it. Again, an update or an update, I feel like from the... The one that dropped in spring summer 2023 again that was a similar type of short jacket but they've kind of elongated it put a hood on it and it's pretty cool i feel this jacket here the reverse hound's tooth jacket is very nice the black memes um what you call it leather motorcycle jacket is beautiful it reminds me of like some crinkled up slp um designed by hedy slamain era type of jacket this umbro um supreme jacket is also very nice if i was into that kind of you know garb in terms of football faux football world wear it i'm loving this um faux for anorak also very native right um you've also got what else oh you got this jacket too which i think i said before this is designed if i'm not mistaken by a kid that's also modeling for supreme i think it's this this kid here where is he i think it's modeled by one of these kids who also works for them I okay, guess so it's the wrong collection. Let me see the lookbook again. Let me go back. It's the wrong collection. It's the wrong lookbook, actually, wasn't it? So let's go to the front here. I think it's this lookbook, yeah, for spring, for fall, winter. There's a kid on here who actually is modeling for them, who actually has his own brand. I think he's actually got the look on himself, head to toe. This kid here, if I'm not mistaken, he actually had his own brand that does a particular type of, the similar type of design here with the, you know, with the embroidery, the contrast stitching, the panels and shit. And he's also been, you know, plugged in to help them do some design in house, which is great. I'm sure they've done this before because Supreme have a good, you know, they have a quite clearly a good sort of um, in-house team. And they love to promote people in-house as well instead of going externally, which is great. Um, this jacket here is also great. This two-in-one Gore-Tex Polartec jacket looks very, very, very fantastic. I'm all over that. I love it more so in this kind of pinky, it's washed out pink color is just sublime as is this fleece over here um and just too many other great pieces man the whole collection is fucking flames another standout for me is um the, obviously the hell shirt is banging um the photography about that snow but one of the standouts for me is this these coach jackets i remember being such a fan of coach jackets when i first got into streetwear because it's obviously a quintessential streetwear item like the t-shirt like the baseball cap like the jeans like the sneakers um co you know coach's jacket can go with just about anything they look great with vans they look good with shoes shorts whatever um and supreme generally do a really good one and this is a very simple coach jacket in terms of you know the what you call it the kind of you know the 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 shiny whatever material outer that is and then it's got a nice kind of lining on the inside which they said here is cotton with a taffeta sleeve lining which is nice and then it also comes with these nice little cutaways also so you've got a, a great a great green kelly green maybe you got a navy and you got an orange and a black if i was going to go for colorways i'll probably go for anything but black maybe orange and green and maybe third black but orange and green are definitely the two colors i'd probably go for in this type of 
garb. So you've got the coach's jacket, which I've showed you. You've got the hell t-shirt. There's a nice button up shirt here. The lined flannel snap shirt is fucking brilliant. Supreme's ability to put together a good plaid shirt is very, very unparalleled as is this plaid flannel shirt here with this, this plaid design. Um, this uh, thermal sleeve work shirt is also very good. You can cosplay as somebody else to fix things. I love this silk map cardigan. Um, this jersey with the bones on the top is just fucking great. Like, there's just so much good shit. I feel like this shirt reminds me a little bit of the Brazil shirts that all the I the, all the TikTok baddies are wearing. Um, it's called the uh, glazed athletics short sleeved top. It kind of reminds me of that, maybe because of the color combo. One thing I'm confused about and pissed about they didn't actually do more of is this this blow shirt. This blow sweatshirt, sorry, I'd definitely wear, obviously for more reasons than not. But I feel like this design or this font would work incredibly well on a hat or a snap hat, a beanie or something. But I checked it last time, maybe, I'm, maybe I was rushing or maybe I was too excited and my dick was too hard and I couldn't pay attention. But I don't remember seeing the same logo or design on any other piece of clothing that he had available. It's just a sweatshirt. But I wish they would do this blow thing on other bits and pieces of my computer. It's taking ages to load. But I feel like this design would work really well on other bits and pieces, this blow thing. Let's just load it here one more time. The computer's running a bit slow. Bear with me a second here but I wish they would do this design with some other bits and pieces, but for some reason they haven't. And we have to kind of just do with the fucking sweatshirt. But I do like it to be fair, it does look pretty cool. Oh, and I also love the cable knit jumper here that again, or cable knit cardigan, sorry, that definitely reminds me of stuff that Jermaine has done at Denim Tears. I'm not too sure if this is something that he had his hand on, if it's something they just done in, in the house or, you know, without his involvement, but still this, Patchwork cable knit cardigan is fucking beautiful. You've got this very chunky cable knit jumper with these great um, wooden buttons on it that look fucking gorgeous. Like, look at the buttons, like, great. Don't get me wrong, there's, you know, the, the, the logo on it is kind of giving swastika, but apart from that, I love the fucking um, look of it with the patchwork all over it again with the different types of cable knit or different colors of cable knit jumpers all patched into each other to make the cardigan and then they've got this more ethnic urban 80s you know um runs out no fresh prince of bel-air type of style patchwork jumper as well which i'm also a big fan of and um, that looks absolutely incredible i'd wear the fuck out of that and i'm not usually a fan of cardigans and that kind of you know frothy faffy jake's drake's type of wear or jake's drake's type of wear you know the brand not the artist i also love this um rl polo influenced um rose rugby shirt this is definitely going to be very popular with a um, certain group of um, you know supreme fans like the patches the embroidery the color combination of it in white is fucking gorgeous the other colorway is not really anything to shout back shout home about the black and the pink colorway is a bit naff but i feel like this colorway in the white is fucking great it's fucking beautiful 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 i cannot deny i love that i also love this um plaid shirt i think supreme always do a good job with their plaid shirts um as you can see here the designs this one if i'm not mistaken has snap buttons it's a bit thicker so it kind of wears a bit like a jacket if i'm not mistaken actually actually if you zoom in a little bit you can actually see it's more of a jacket than it is anything else isn't it yeah you can actually see here it's more of a jacket actually there as you can see, there's more of a jacket type of vibe. Unfortunately, there's no pockets on the side. That's kind of a bit of a shame. But again, lovely flannel nonetheless. Uh, Supreme on the back is a bit un, you know, unnecessary, the embroidery. But hey, you know, they have to let people know what it's about when it comes to the shirts. And then if I keep scrolling down and pass all the other good shit, there's, there's so many good things here. We'll get onto some of the hats, which I love, which I love. Let me scroll down here with the hats. Too many good ones to mention. Um, obviously, I can only wear five panels and shit. I can't wear camp cats, so fuck all the rest of them. The one with the um, this this design here. Was what is it? Was it called? It's called the uh, Neil Blender Arrow. Um, six panel i'm a big fan of this one so big up that way especially the shape as well the shape is fucking incredible and big up no blend on the official artwork the shape and this is hats are so good like they look incredible on they're gonna fit my big rotund fucking head shape and then we've also got the ones i like is this one with mess logo or the mess sort of badge on it um same can go for the camacho one 
and obviously the pins bucket hat i'd wear the fuck out but i can't wear bucket hats my head check just doesn't mess with them i also like this pin up mesh this pin up five panel mesh is brilliant this hat a little bit I'm not sure if you guys agree but this hat kind of reminds me of mizzy i wonder if they've been influenced by mizzy this hand tied beanie with these little frilly bits on it kind of reminds me of the kind of classic um iconic mizzy hat mizzy the prankster that goes around getting arrested for telling people that reality is illusion and walking into people's houses and shit that kind of reminds me a little bit of him but um yeah free your door or well, bang your doors mizzy if you're in jail if you're not in jail get well soon one one or the other <laughs> um what else i love oh my god let's let's talk about the last bit here cause i don't want to come too much because i'm so excited but the other thing that I want to talk about that I'm really excited about is this backpack. This might be one of the best backpacks I've seen them design in a while. And again, I'm a big fan of Supreme backpacks. I've actually got one here, as you can see, that I wear from time to time. And I've also got a bunch in my collection that I have from previous years. But this might be one of my favorite designs, like especially when it comes to the, you know, the, the what you call it especially when it comes to the different panels and shit and the shape of it overall like god almighty this looks fucking beautiful so a backpack water resistant nylon rips up um x-pack laminated base with a frame reflected molded logo which is for me the beauty to find a touch of it i kind of want a red backpack i would probably get another type of model on these but i think if i was to get this i would definitely get it in this colorway which is kind of gray blue this champagne colorway in black um, you've got the nice chunky straps, nice comfortable on the back with these little molded bits as well to kind of alleviate some of the stress and kind of allow you to perspirate a little bit better. It also comes in red, which is absolutely gorgeous, and this coke white color as, as well as the black. But the best bit is this. Look at the fucking 3M glow. Look at that 3M fucking glow. Are you crazy? Imagine being on the back on the back of your fixie, riding, walk, running down the street in, on your twenty nine inch BMX, hurling expletives at people walking by you and having this glow of supreme at the back of you while you're riding. I fucking love it, man. One of my favorite bags. This backpack is so brilliant, and of course, some of the other bags in the collection are also great. Um, this tote bag is also a fucking underrated in terms of its shape overall, as a as a kind of daily. DJ baggy type of you know something a bit bigger than a side bag and something not as big as a backpack I actually might go for these as my daily drivers because at the moment I'm carrying a fucking Telfar bag which feels a little bit corny but I think I might have to start going for these totes because they do them every year um, this shape but I generally never kind of jump on them but they look really good especially with these you know these color combos maybe with this I'd probably opt to go in the red or the black but I do like the shape of them obviously the fucking waist bag is fucking brilliant I'm now a fan because I'm a little bit older I'm now a fan of just wearing a waist bag like a waist bag actually having it on my waist it looks pretty cool as opposed to having it across your fucking body like a cross bag um, then you've got these little small bags the shoulder bags are pretty decent to put little things in and they've also got these small cinch bags which you'd assume will be used to climb but most people are going to store them to have their little fucking their nanks and their little pills in there and shit when they go on festivals and then you've also got these leather bags which i feel like probably be the better option to do if i was going to get a whole red backpack because the red one in leather looks beautiful it'll probably be very expensive because it's made out of leather so i'm assuming this might be like 600 or maybe more but the leather bags are fucking gorgeous man they look so good so the small pouch bags as well so big up them for putting those together and then i think that might be it and i think the last thing to talk about of course is the fucking supreme technics turntables which are going to be flying off the shelves if they've made them to spec if they've made them you know how you'd think they're going to be able to make them these are going to be flying out of the door and i can't wait for them to eventually make their own fucking pioneer cdjs those are going to be really popular so you see here there's a pair of supreme technic sl um 120 mark 7 turntables uh, you know the quintessential legendary turntable that all your DJs favorite DJs have kind of played on over the years some of them not so many but it's essentially white on the top because most of them are black and then you've got the supreme label and you've got the supreme label on the slip mat and that's about it it looks like but instead of that it's just all being I guess maybe made to spec or maybe reissued let's actually read the, the description 
the Technics SL um, 1200 series of DJ turntables features a cordless direct drive motor, vibration damping platter, 78 RPM speed with wider pitch adjustments, reverse play functions and removable cables, hingeless dust cover with printed logos, inset metal badge at base and printed logo on the slip mat cartridge not included so no what you call it no needle or anything as per usual you would just get the fucking turntables but they look fucking brilliant really fucking good i can't imagine what clubs will end up having them because these are going to get trashed so quickly people already destroyed turntables in clubs anyway don't treat them with any respect so you can imagine what supreme ones are going to look like especially after people's k drug filled hands have been knobbed all over them but that's an amazing accessories as they always do with their little knickknacks they're always fucking fantastic and then the other knickknack that i like also is the skull right the skull with the fucking gold grill those are great these headphones are fucking fantastic um these um supreme cos porter pro headphones i like the look of them because they just remind me of like um old school headphones like with a wired cable on them and just like walkman type of headphones but i wonder if they are they actually sound good i actually wouldn't mind tearing take checking them out as a novice audiophile myself to see what they actually sound like and um, maybe there'll be something to use for podcasting you never know so that's an actual good tip but overall great collection i don't want to wank too much about it because i've already fucking probably bored you guys all to death about it but absolutely fantastic loved every little bit about it and i can't wait to see some of this stuff in store see some people wearing this in real life and obviously be able to purchase some of the stuff myself when it eventually drops the lookbook is fantastic i'm not sure if they purposely sized up everything everyone's wearing but the styling's amazing the photography is brilliant it all looks so wearable like that that jacket is just so hard like come on man you can't tell me this jacket it's not hard um yeah everything about it is fucking amazing and great i want every piece of it as is usual you know with supreme they do a good job of making you want everything that they fucking make um every fucking season and yeah i can't wait to see it eventually in people's hands when they eventually do get it but yeah brilliant stuff from supreme we love everything we can't wait for it to drop so check it out when it does drop i think according to them Where's the news here? Which tell you when they're going to drop it here. They said it's going to be available in stores and online for the 17th and then available in Japan stores on the 19th. Blah, de, blah, blah, blah. So check that out if you can. And let's see random. It's random NBA Youngboy. No, NBA um, Random is the hood fishing guy. So pick up him um, for doing that. And we're going to see some more bits, I guess, coming up when it comes up. So big up them big up them cannot deny it cannot deny it cool so that might be it for the i guess you know zinger show episode number what i think i said six nine eight or six nine eight what did i say Oh, episode number 699 thanks for tuning in it's been a pleasure to have your company if you're the first time to check out the show you know what to do uh, smash the like it you know and all that malarkey leave me a comment down below share it with your friends i'd be greatly appreciate if you listen to the audio version of the show you'll definitely hear me you know over some nice cool beats now for the tune of the day so if you haven't listened to the tune of the day definitely check out the audio side of the podcast to hear that and you know all descriptions in the fucking player wherever you're using we'll have everything you need to know about the tune today and the topics and shit and i'll see all of you guys again very soon take care be safe peace